had an interest in in terms of commodities. Um, when I was younger, my grandmother and I would watch the news, and I'm not too sure how the news works all over the world, but here in South Africa, um, at the end of the news, it's obviously weather and sports, and then they always would have the slideshow showing different commodities, uh, namely gold and oil, and they'd show the prices, and the prices would change every day. So I would be like, why is that? What's causing the prices to change? And then, of course, they would show the exchange rates as well. So I was always interested in that last slideshow that would show every day on the news and, and the changes in that. But um, I don't have an amazing, philosophical, heart-wrenching story that drove me to the mining industry. Rather, it was pure capitalism. Um, growing up, I wanted to be a civil engineer. Uh, my neighbor drove the fanciest Mercedes Benz I'd ever seen, and he was a civil engineer. And I thought to myself, well, that's it. I have to be a civil engineer. Um, but in 2006, I was in my 11th grade. And in the 11th grade, you start preparing for university and you send through application of what you would like to study. And the only option I had was civil engineer. <laughs> That Sunday evening, the day before I was due to submit my application form to the university, I was reading the Sunday newspaper, and on the cover of Business Times was Patrice Motepe, and it said, mining tycoon Patrice Motepe now worth 8 billion rand. I ran to my dad's computer and I started Googling all the different careers one could do in mining because... I wanted to become a billionaire like Patrice. So um, I eventually fell in love with the option of becoming a geologist. And so the second option I put down in my university application form was geology, and I've never looked back. There definitely has been a um, higher number of women in, in, in the sector. I mean, in 2018, there was 11% representation, and now there's 12% representation in South Africa in terms of a woman in mining. So there definitely is an increase. However, the increase is not substantial. 12% of the entire sector is, 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 is tiny. When you look at the fact that 50% you know, of, of the population is female, yet only 12% extreme underrepresentation in the sector when you compare it with other sectors. So while there are changes that are being made in the mining industry, including um, flexibility, including, um, you know, compensation, it, it's not at the level where it should be yet. And I don't think the mining industry has sufficiently done a good enough job of going out and promoting all those changes that have been made in the industry. I still talk to a lot of people who still have an idea that if you're working in the mining industry, you're living in a hostel um, and you are subject to very poor conditions and they don't understand the differences that even technology improvements have made to the mining industry itself and conditions for women. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of PR um, in the mining sector to ensure that women are joining the sector. But absolutely, there has been improvements in the numbers at 12%, which was dismal um, five, even 10 years ago. Uh, it's not it's moving. It's not moving at the rate that you would expect it to um, because I just don't think that the mining industry has done a good enough job or let me not say a good enough job has has gone out of their way to ensure that the the publicity around all the good work because as a person who has been on the ground I've seen the changes I understand the good work that has gone into improving conditions for women but it just not has not been put out there in a way where young women and girls are talking about the industry and opportunities within the industry. So, you know, when I talk about women in mining, um, I, I don't look at women in mining as a monolithic group, um, as, as just one group of, of, of individuals. Um, I don't group them. And the reason for that is I've had experience of being a technical female on an operation, and now I have the experience of working in a mining corporate environment. So I 
you know, I'm currently working on my master's thesis right now, looking at the underrepresentation of technical women in executive roles in mining companies. And I basically, one of the key findings that I have is that all women in mining are not equal. So the women who are sitting on operations and working underground or working in the pit at the plant in the remote locations don't have the same opportunity and access as the women who are working in mining corporations. When you look at the representation of executives in mining companies, it's usually chief financial officers, so women who come from finance. It's usually human resources, women who come from HR, or women in corporate relations who come from sustainability um, and investor relations. So those women are women in mining. However, they've been given an opportunity to work in the corporate office, which is usually located in a city. So here in South Africa, it'll be located in Johannesburg. Uh, many mining corporates have head offices in London um, and it's in the city. Uh, women who work in, 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 in corporates have an opportunity to be close to their children's schools, have the access to, um, you know, the best healthcare facilities, have the opportunity to come into work at 9 a.m. because they can drop their children off at school and leave at 3 p.m. to pick their children up from school. So the transition of becoming a mother does not necessarily affect them um, in terms of their careers. However, Women who are working on operations have a completely different experience. If you're a woman in mining and you fall pregnant, you cannot access your working area because it's deemed a high risk zone. So if you fall pregnant, you cannot go underground, you cannot go to the pit or work in your plant. Therefore, you cannot um, do your core function because of the fact that your core function is usually done in a high risk area. So due to that, um, you lose nine months of experience. And once you lose that nine months of experience and you've given birth to your child, a further three months is lost while you're on maternity leave. And when you come back and you still choose to breastfeed for another three months, that means you still can't go back to those high risk areas. So you can lose between 12 to 18 months of your work experience, clearly, basically just on having a child, which is not the case when you are a woman in mining who works in a corporate. So I think it's very important to lay the foundation of understanding that when you are talking about women in mining, you're talking about two very different groups who are having two very different experiences. So it's also very important that mining companies and mining executives have an understanding of this. And when they talk about women in mining, you're not just talking about women who work at the mine, but women who work in the mine. So it's very important to look at the needs of those women who work in mining um, to ensure that they also are met to give them the same opportunities in rising in mining companies as the women who are working at the mine. Yeah, well, absolutely. So um, one of the key uh, the shifts that I've seen last year uh, was work that has been done by the Minerals Council of South Africa. So the Minerals Council of South Africa is basically an organization where different mining companies within the African uh, region sit um, and send representatives, so the different CEOs of those companies, and they sit and they discuss certain issues that affect and impact on South African mining. So uh, one of the key things that happened last year was that they brought in the Women in Mining South Africa organization to, to be a key partner with the Minerals Council. So women in mining came in and, and, and basically laid on the table the different issues that are faced by women in mining in South Africa and the different conditions that women in mining in South Africa face, which I had alluded to previously on, on the women in mining are not all equal. So what that did is that it transpired in um, Minerals Council producing a white paper. And the white paper basically talks to what mining companies need to do to ensure that you know more and more women are attracted to the industry 
But most importantly, more and more women are retained within the industry. And I think that's a conversation that's not really had is so many people speak about attraction, uh, but not enough people are speaking about retention. I myself am a woman in mining who worked as an underground geologist um, and I had a you know, wonderful time, learned a lot. But it got to a point where I wanted so much more for my life than just to go underground and, and blast rocks every day. And I, I asked the mining company I was working for at the time, what else can I do in the business to, to diversify my skill set and, and grow and learn and, and eventually one day move on to become the CEO of this organization? And I was told, your job is to go underground and mine. Just, just do that well, you'll be fine. And I had to leave the mining industry. So I left um, after a few years and I moved into finance, um, into investment banking, just to give myself a diversification of skill sets so I could come back to the industry and say, well, now I know mining and finance. Um, so just having those conversations around retention is important. So a white paper was produced and one of the key things that was discussed was ensuring that for mining executives and senior managers, Attraction and retention of female staff is a key performance indicator. So, which is very important because I think everyone knows when something hits your pocket, um, you know, you're going to do something about it. So, I, I absolutely have seen a shift in all these mining companies coming together. I think one of the key things I had, you know, discussed with women in mining South Africa was the fact that they did not have support from mining companies. They did not have um, financial support to go out to schools and talk about different career options for young girls within the mining industry. But mine, Minerals Council bringing women in mining in South Africa and hopefully we'll see a shift in that, we'll see a change in that, we'll see um, resources being given to women in mining so they can go out there and, and spread the word, not only to attract women to the industry, but also give women the platform to speak about what they what their needs are to be able to retain them within the industry. And within Anglo-American, I think one of the key things that I've seen has been a shift in how you know, mining is perceived. Um, we have a concept called future smart mining, which basically talks to what does the mine of the future look like? The mine of the future <clears throat> no longer looks like you know, men sweating underground, carrying these, you know, uh, drills. It it looks like young women in, in, in corporate offices pressing a button to blast. So it's it's looking at the fact that young women can be included because the key indicator of your ability to be in the mining sector 50 years ago was your was your masculinity and your strength. Today it can be your intelligence. So I've seen the drive in Anglo-American trying to push that mining is going to be so much more than just taking rocks out of the ground. It's going to be understanding how to talk to communities. It's going to be understanding how to talk to your end user of your products and creating markets and, you know, understanding artificial intelligence and digitization and bringing all those skill sets in is going to diversify the base in which you have to look at and so so many more people besides just strong men i can come into the sector and and, and drive um so i think one of the key things as i mentioned earlier on was pr um just pure pr the mining sector has done so much good and not only for women in mining, but in general for communities, contributed so much to government, um, local and, 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 and national government. But those stories are not being heard. The mining industry are not using the correct platforms. Well, not sufficiently using the correct platforms to, to sing their own praises. And I think when people understand the changes that have occurred in the industry, when people understand how modern the mind the minds look today versus you know 20 years ago and how modern they're going to look in five years from now um, that PR can go a long way in attracting more and more young women to the industry and I think what can be learned from other sectors is is structure so one of the key things that came out in my master's study as well is that young technical women are saying 
I don't know what I have to do to become a CEO. I don't know what I have to do to become an executive director or the head of mining within my co company because there's no clear path which has been set to get to that role. Other industries such as the accounting industry and even the legal industry have very clear and set paths that one can take to become a partner. So you do your board exams, um, you serve this much time, you work on so many cases or you audit so many firms and that takes you up the ranks and you can start, you know, talking and having those conversations around what is the next step? How do I get to the senior management position? How do I become a partner? And having those clear paths has really, you know, I believe um, put women and men at an equal level in terms of opportunity. So if I'm a young woman coming into an Ernest and Young and I have, you know, done my articles, I've written all my exams and I'm at a place now where I'm ready for the next step, myself and my male counterpart have both the equal opportunity because we've both walked the same path. And I think that hasn't necessarily been brought into mining as to what is the exact things that I need to do um, and what are the time frames that are given for me to do those things to be able to move into the next role. So definitely looking at other sectors, that's something that we could learn from is just defining um, clear, clear, clear roles and parts for women that they can take. I, I mean, my, I've had a very colorful career. Um, I have worked as a, as a geologist um, underground, as I mentioned, and you know, I, I wanted something more, so I moved into investment banking and I worked as a sell side analyst and then I worked in asset management for a few years prior to my coming back into the sector. And the intention was never to leave mining and become an executive of, you know, Ernest and Young. <laughs> um, the, the, the investment banking experience for me was an opportunity to learn the business of mining. However, when I was looking at making an entrance back into the mining sector, a lot of the roles that were coming up required for me to take a demotion to be able to work my way back up so that one day I can finally be in an executive office in a mining company. And, and that just didn't make sense to me. I'm like, I've built a 10 year history just to come back into mining to be told you have to come back a step down for you to be able to learn how things work. So I, I, I it, it's a very bad point that you're making and hearing other people have said it as well. It's 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 not clear. And because it's so unclear, unfortunately, so, so many people end up leaving. Right, so I, I, um, I, I believe that representation is 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 not spoken enough about. Um, representation is 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 so important because when you see yourself in someone, and when you see someone who looks like you and sounds like you or has the same background as you, um, achieving certain things, it, it it breaks the barrier and makes you think, well, if they can, so can I. And you know, at, when I was at school, my mom insisted that I do science and maths. Even when I was struggling at some point, I think in the 11th grade, I, I, I was struggling. I was being pulled through. Um, my mom insisted that I stay because of the fact that, and she kept saying to me, when you do science and maths, it opens you up to so many opportunities. You can choose to be an engineer and you can get in because you've got the, you know, the, the science and maths from high school. Um, or you can choose to be an accountant. Uh, which your science and maths wouldn't count, but you still have the choice or you can be a lawyer. So your choices aren't narrowed down if you are a, if you have science and maths. So that's one thing that I grew up knowing. It was all about the ability to have choice. And I think what's important for young girls right now is understanding the choice and the options and the doors that can be open from doing science, technology, engineering and mathematics at school. Um, it's still shocking to me to know that in South Africa, only 13% of university, 13% of university STEM graduates are female. That's because there clearly isn't enough 
women coming in from high school into those uh, STEM degrees at university. So it's it's catching young women while they're young. And for me, it's celebrating young women who have come into STEM and gone into STEM careers and putting them on platforms where young women can see them and then in turn see themselves in them. And so what I did um, in beginning of this year is that I started a Instagram page called STEM Girls SA. And the entire purpose of the page was to celebrate young women in STEM. So um, celebrating young women who've gone to study actuarial sciences and obtained those qualifications and went on to work for some of the largest insurance companies in, 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 in the country and celebrating young women who've gone into mining, who've gone into different engineering fields. And I also make t-shirts like this one um, that says Steminist. And I sell these to um, male and females. I have a lot of male friends who wear them, who say they, they too are STEMinists. Because, you know, when you're a STEMinist, you are all about, you know, the advocacy for young women in STEM. So it's, for me, having the conversation and having the representation out there, making sure that young women and girls see other young women thriving within STEM careers. And, and that representation and seeing themselves can go such a long way. And I know that was something for me um, that played a role in where I am today, seeing a Patrice Modepe while he may be a male, but seeing a person of my skin tone um, be one of the most successful people in the industry made me go, I too can be a part of it and I too can obtain as much success as he has. I think the most important thing is you have to have grit. Um, and I think that's for any workspace. Having had worked in investment banking and having had worked in mining, you're only going to get as far as, as you believe you can get. And you're only going to get what you ask for. So, you know, unfortunately, most male spaces are still dominated. Having worked in investment banking, I worked in all male teams as I did when I was working underground. And that's because men have always had the head start. I mean, in the 50s and 60s, you know, women weren't taking up spaces in corporates. Men brought home the bacon. So women have had a later start across all sectors. The representation might be higher, but it's still not equal in, in other sectors outside of mining. So I think you have to have that mentality of it's not a mining issue that they are, there's an underrepresentation of women. But in any space that you walk into, you have to know exactly what you want. You have to be persistent in what you want. And you also have to have great resilience. And that's where the grit comes in. You have to have resilience to say, you know, challenges of people undermining me, challenges of people maybe even keeping me out of certain meetings because they don't think I have what it takes to contribute, uh, speaking from experience here, um, because I'm so young, because I am a female. You have to have the grit to look past that and focus on what you want to achieve. And when you do that, you understand that you have to fight for your place. Um, you put your hand up and you say, you know, I can and I want to do this specific project. When you're left out of a meeting, you say, I was left out. Is there a reason? Uh, how can I contribute um, to the next meeting? You just make yourself seen um, and, and you shouldn't be afraid to ruffle a few feathers. Um, courage is very important when you are trying to get to where you want to get. Um, and that in include speaking up for yourself. So that grit of knowing what you want and working past through challenges is very important because you're still, even though the industry has changed significantly, um, when you do walk into an operation, there still will be a bit of resistance to having a young woman on site, um, but you have to know why you're there and what you want out of that opportunity. Yeah, so I mean, walking into the industry, I did not have the influences. So I didn't come into the industry from seeing women in mining. Um, however, when I did start 
you know, my career in mining, I started researching who are these women that are sitting in top positions um, in, in mining companies. And um, I found Cynthia Carroll, who at the time when I was a graduate was the CEO of Anglo American. And then reading up on her profile and finding out that she too is a geologist is, is really what inspired me um, because I saw her and saw the, the, the path that she walked. She became a geologist and then she moved on to also get some executive experience in investment banking. And I thought to myself, well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That's what I'm, I'm going to follow her path. I'm going to be just like her. So I think seeing her um, in that role in a time where there were no other women who were in those roles in South Africa um, made me go, if she can do it and she's a geologist, so can I. So she had a great um, impact on me in terms of understanding that there is no ceiling because you only think that there's a ceiling sometimes when you don't see yourself represented in certain spaces. So she made me believe that I can reach that level too because someone has. And in terms of other women who have just influenced me, it's it's been not even women in executive roles. It's been women in HR who I've gone to to complain about a certain minor, uh, you know, shouting at me uh, or talking down to me and calming me down and putting my head back on my shoulders and reminding me of my, my purpose. Um, it's been women such as the cleaners um, on, in, on the mine who have shown the greatest of kindness to me on, on days that were very difficult um, and days that were extremely challenging. And just seeing different women around you supporting you um, while you were struggling, that, that's had the greatest impact for me within the mining career. And of course, finding um, another female geologist uh, on site and, and, and building bonds around the challenges and building a sisterhood, um, that's been the greatest impact. So Cynthia definitely impacted me on what I could be but women in and around the mine impacted me on, on my resilience and, and, and staying on course. So, you know, one of the, the, the things that I did for, for my thesis was, was obviously a questionnaire and um, we spoke to, I think, 50 women. And there are so many barriers that um, you know one can can think of, uh, namely, namely motherhood um, and the changes that occur in your life when you are a mother. Um, so I, I already spoke to the fact that you lose so much experience. So when you come back to the mind, you're you're one year behind your male peers. They are moving on to the next level because they've had this experience, but you have to, you have to catch up on 18 months. Uh, one of the things that also impacts you as, as, as a new mother is the fact that when you are working on a mining operation, unfortunately, mines were designed with men in mind. Um, and that's just the nature of, 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 of the industry. That's the structural nature of the industry. Mines were designed with men in mind. So the shifts were also designed with men in mind. Um, when I was working underground, we had to be on site at 6 a.m., which, which doesn't mean arriving on the mine at 6 a.m. You had to be in your overalls, ready to go underground in a cage at 6 a.m. So when you have a young child, you do not have the opportunity to go and drop off your your child at preschool um, or at school at 7 a.m. because there are no preschools that are open at 5 a.m. So unfortunately, because of that, um, you have to have a great support system around you, um, which unfortunately is not the case most of the time because you are you do have to relocate. Um, to a, a, a foreign area um, or a remote area that is um, when you're working on a mining operation. So you leave your family behind. So it's bringing your family in to, li to, to live with you, 
um, or maybe even having a supportive husband who does not work in mining um, can definitely assist. So it's also the awkward nature of shifts for some women, for example, who work in the plants. Um, they are sometimes called out at 2 a.m. And, and if you're a single mom, you're not going to be able to make that shift because you have no one to leave your child with. So it's it's that lack of support around um, motherhood. When women fall pregnant on the mine, a lot of the times there's no there's no plan. So I can't go underground for nine months. So what am I going to do now? And, you know, it, people will scratch their heads. Well, you could you could just go and help out in planning or something. And I've, I've heard those conversations and then the young woman will get there in planning and planning doesn't have a plan for her. <laughs> the irony is not lost on me. Um, and, you know, you, you lose so much time um, because of a pregnancy, which is something which is natural for women. So mining companies just not having an idea of what can be done to say, based on the fact that you can't go underground in this time frame, we're going to ensure that you go on a development program and you learn how to manage people, um, or you learn certain soft skills that are going to be required when you move on to new roles. And then, of course, there's the unfortunate harsh reality that there is still some resistance um, to women um, being underground. Um, so there still are a lot of men who have pushed back to women working in their sex sections. Um, there are still some men who will leave women out of, of meetings and not give them the relevant exposure and experience. And, you know, mentorship is a huge, huge, huge gap um, in, in the mining industry, and not just mentorship, but mentorship and sponsorship. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, men get along well with other men. Um, and so older senior men will bring young men in. Um, they'll take them underground and they'll show them the ropes and they'll take them for a beer after work and, and, and tell them that, you know, if you do X, Y, and Z, if you are close with uh, our production manager, if you come to this meeting and you talk about this, you're going to shine. And that mentorship and sponsorship of young men by other men assists in, in, in taking them forward. And young women, unfortunately, not having the access to that and not having the access to that from men and not having the access to that because of a lack of senior women within their own organization is why young women don't necessarily even know the path um, and the route they can take to move on to, to the next role. So that's it's very, very important to address just key issues which seem very trivial because you would think, well, mentorship should just be something that is, you know, happens organically, but it doesn't. Unfortunately, men still choose to stick together um, and, and in doing so young women are often left out so those are some of the key challenges and, and, and I think sponsorship goes a long way and I think intentional leadership it goes a long way as well so you know when young women do come to a mining operation or do join the mining sector that intentional leadership will lead to sponsorship so ensuring that you understand what is happening with their development. You understand what is happening in terms of their exposure and, and the opportunities that are being presented to them. So that's that's very important in terms of getting young women into the sector, keeping them and breaking down those barriers. But I think what's also important um, is, is using your voice wherever you are as a female. Um, when I was at, um, an asset management company, the last asset management company I worked for, which is the largest in Africa. I um, worked for obviously an underground mining company and I knew of a young woman who had all the different certificates that are required to become a senior manager within a mining organization. And yet white men were being um, put in that role to act while they were looking for a replacement for that specific position. She had the relevant experience and relevant qualifications, and she was not looked at for the role. When the executive team 
of that specific company came to a meeting with myself and my team at the asset management firm, I asked them specifically about the role and I asked them why they had not looked at that specific female individual. You know, the management team was taken aback and they said, oh, no, we don't know how this happened. We're definitely going to have a look at it. And six months down the line, I get a call to hear that she has been promoted into that role. So it's all about using your voice wherever you are to ensure that you speak up for other women. And when you put other young women up for opportunities and present them and showcase their skill sets, that's intentional leadership and that sponsorship that's required that could definitely break down the barriers that exist.